When David writes Psalm 139, he writes it in a climate in his life and kingdom where things are not going well. Now here's the truth. You could have picked a number of days in David's life when things were not going well. He, though he was the sweet singer of Israel and a man after God's own heart, he was also a sinner. And he also was the leader of a kingdom. And anytime you are leading people and they're as diverse as they were, um, it can be a difficult time. What I notice about David in this psalm, however, is something that really encourages me. When he was suffering difficulty, he did not right away go and say, Lord, show me who is the problem. Show me the person that's causing my trouble. God, get the one who's making me feel the way I do. And so often that is our reaction when we face difficulties in our life. God, it's somebody else. They're doing this. They're doing that. What David said was, Lord, will you search me? Will you deal with me? We live in a generation and a culture where we are getting less and less sensitive to sin. Sin in our culture, but let's be honest, sin in our own lives. I don't often bring up fairy tales, but a fairy tale maybe you've heard of, the princess and the pea. A queen mother is looking for a spouse for her son, And her son is going to be king, and thus the lady that he marries has to be very refined and and have a hint of royalty in her. And so she sends throughout the kingdom uh, her her, uh, notice that we're looking for um, the one for my son. And of course, when a prince is looking for a wife in this kingdom, a lot of responses. Uh, This dear lady responded, and by the time she got to the palace to introduce herself, she had been in a rainstorm, and she looked bedraggled when she came to the front door. But she had an appointment. Queen Mother let her in. But the Queen Mother was going to really put her to the test, really see just if she was a refined lady or not. And so she instructed her servants. This is a fairy tale, not a true story, okay? Okay. She instructed her servants, I want you to put her a very comfortable mattress down and a second mattress and a third mattress and a fourth mattress on up and then coverings and coverings and coverings. But under that bottom mattress, I want you to simply place a pea, a pea. Well, the lady went in and slept the next morning. She got up. She came out, and the queen mother asked her, how did you sleep? And the lady responded, oh, terribly. There was something that just dug into my back all night long, a pea. Well, I don't know about you. I don't think I'd have ever noticed the pea, would you? But that is how sensitive to sin in our lives we ought to be. When we're not right with God, when there's something in our hearts, in our lives, that are not what it should be, and they have no business in there, there ought to be a sensitivity in our lives that drives us to, with the help of the Holy Spirit, get that thing out of our life. But sadly, all too often, we've grown accustomed to just letting it lay there. Just accepting it. We're not as bad as those, and Well, you know, it could be worse, and well, you know, it's just who I am. Well, God gives us the Holy Spirit to stop being who we are, to change us. And David was a man, though he was a sinner like you and I, and he committed gross sin, he was also very sensitive to sin. And when it comes to facing the difficulties in his life, he says to the Lord, Lord, before I start blaming and before I start accusing, Lord, I want you to do this. I want you to look at me. I want you to examine me because I can't change the world. I can't change my home. I can't change my church. I can't change where I work until you work on me. And then people will be changed in relation to the change that they see in me. And so to accomplish that, he says, Lord, I want you to search me. 
I want you to try me, and I want you to lead me. I want you to notice those with me this morning. Number one, he says, Lord, would you search me? Now, here's the truth. You and I cannot honestly search our own hearts. Not only do we not have the capacity to know and discern, but we also tend to overlook the more serious flaws of our own character and our lives. You see, we have a serious conflict of interest. I love me. Yeah. And you could say the same thing. You love you. And sometimes I don't want to see me exactly as I am. And sometimes I need the Holy Spirit of God to reveal to me just who I am. Let me illustrate it. My wife said to me years ago, we need a full-length mirror. I said, we don't need a full-length mirror. I don't want to see this. She said, we need a full-length mirror. I said, okay, we'll get a full-length mirror. But I said, don't get it till I'm home. We'll buy it. I'll go with you. I'll get the mirror we want. And uh, we only shop in the finer stores. So at Walmart, you know, they always stack these mirrors up against the wall. And uh, I, I said, now let me take a look. I'll tell you which mirror we want. I said, boy, that's not it. Because the way the glass was bent, I was four foot two and 400 pounds. And we went through several more until we found that one. You know which one we found? Where the glass is bent and I'm six foot 170. I said, that's our mirror right there. And it's hanging in our house today. You know why? Because I don't want to see me how I really am. I want to see me how I think I am. And all of us are afflicted with that disease. We think better of ourselves than we actually are. And David says, God, I want you to pierce my heart. I want you to look at my heart. Can I remind you of something about our hearts? That they are desperately wicked. They're deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the answer comes, I the Lord search the heart. James Vaughn says this, self-examination is not the simple thing which at first sight it might appear. No Christian who has ever really practiced it has found it easy. Is there any exercise of the soul which any one of us has found so unsatisfactory, so almost impossible as self-examination? The fact is this, that the heart is so exceedingly complicated and intricate, and it is so very near to the eye which has to investigate it. And both it and the eye are so restless and so shifting that its deep anatomy baffles our research. Just a few things here and there, broad and open, floating upon the surface, a man discovers. But there are chambers receding within chambers, in that deepest of all deep things, a sinner's heart, which no mere human investigation will ever reach. It is the prerogative of God alone to search the human heart. Folks, if there's ever going to be revival in our life, it won't come because a meeting is scheduled. It, it won't come because sermons are preached. It won't come because the right politicians are elected or the right laws are passed. If revival ever comes to our lives, our church, our community, our world, it will be because individual believers say, I will be right with God. I will allow God to search out my heart. I will allow God to to deal with me and then he can be right with God she can be right with God and from their life can flow real Christianity and real witness and it can impact the world and that's where David is and David says I want you to search me literally to examine me thoroughly to be found out David is saying God I want all the masks moved I want all the things that I keep kind of behind the wall revealed I want the disguises removed I want you to show me who and what I am I love that word no where he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. 
Hey, David is not saying, I've successfully hidden these things from you, God, and so now I want you to take a look. God already knows David's heart, and God knows yours. It literally means to make known. You know what David is saying? I want you to so thoroughly examine me, O oh God, and make known to me who I really am. Did you know my wife in ways knows me better than I know me? Because I interpret things differently than she does. I interpret things to my advantage, to my being positive. My wife sees me for what I truly am, and so does God. God already knows every thought, every motive, every appetite, every emotion. And David is just saying, oh God, will you make my heart known to me? Let me see the truth about myself. And as hard as it is for us to admit, the only way we will ever grow to know the truth about ourselves is to invite God to help us see that truth. I dare say if we were to allow God to truly, truly examine our hearts and expose ourselves to us, we would find emotions that we justify in our own lives. We might find motives that God would say, that's all about pride and self. We might find affections in our minds and our hearts that ultimately are displeasing to the Lord and pull us away from the Lord. Oh, God help us. We might find appetites that we, that we justify and we accept as who we are. We might find bitterness deep in our heart from something that occurred to us years ago that we think we are justified to hold in our heart because of how we were treated. And it colors everything in our life. God says it's not acceptable. We might find anger and temper. We might find grudges held for years. And all the time we have pet them and soothed them and accepted them as, as justifiable in our life. And God says, let me pull the mask away from that thing because it's destroying your relationship with people at work and it's affecting your relationship with your spouse and it's marking your relationship with your children and it gets in the way with your walk with me. God says you've accepted it and let it lay there. And when you open it up and say, oh God, would you tell me, would you show me who I really am? God says, yeah, there's some things we've got to deal with. Notice secondly, David says, would you try me? Well, preacher, isn't that the same thing as search me? Oh, no, 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 no. You see, David is not satisfied for God to search his heart. He asks God to try me and to know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. Hey, listen, sometimes we read that, way, that word wicked and we immediately excuse ourselves from that verse because we say, well, I'm not perverse, I'm not wicked. That's not at all what God is saying. Let's see what he's saying. You see, David knew that to best learn about himself, God was going to have to try him to truly scrutinize him, to really deeply examine him. That word thoughts in verse 23, notice it. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, scrutinize me, uh, 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 examine me deeply, and know my thoughts. Makes a very interesting word study. First, David says, try me, or literally examine, scrutinize. But the word thoughts is the Hebrew word seraph. Now you say, preacher, do you know Hebrew? Nope, never took a course in my life. And uh, wouldn't have understood it probably if I took it. But I do own a strong concordance. And it makes me dangerous sometimes. I love study words. I love to look up words. I love to understand words. I love vocabulary. Some people love math and chemistry. I love words. My wife says silence was created for me to fill with talking. <laughs> Wicked woman. It's the Hebrew word seraph, and it means literally division or divided. 
You know what David is saying? David is asking God to expose by trial where his thoughts differ from God's thoughts. Where his way differs from God's way. Then notice that David says, where my thoughts are different than your thoughts, those are wicked ways. Did you know that word wicked is literally the word for idolatry? Look it up. Do you know what David is saying? David is saying there are places in my life where I can choose my way, where I can have my thought and I like my way, and I like my thought, and I justify my way, and I justify my thought, but the truth is when the Holy Spirit examines my way and my thought by His Word and His power, they are different than God's. And every way in my life where I am thinking differently than God, God says that's an idol. That's a wicked way. You've set up your way over my way. You've decided that your thought process is better than mine. You've decided that your value system is better than mine. You've decided that your understanding is better than mine. And it is wicked. Well, I guarantee you, I have the ability to think differently than God. And every way when I think differently than God, God says that's an idol. I, I think to myself, how, how can I think differently than God? Hey, listen, I can think differently to God than God about career. Well, this is what I've always wanted to be. Yeah, well, that's good, but is it what God has always wanted you to be? I, I can think about my marriage well, this is how I think she ought to do it. This is how I think I ought to talk to her. This is how I ought, ought to treat her. Yeah, but is it what God says? My social life. Well, I think I should be able to go here. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, but does God? How I feel about another person. How I'm doing my parenting. Well, I, I'll just be honest with you. I, I just don't think... That, that we have to raise kids like that anymore. Well, listen, I'm not going to put the words in. You decide and your preacher can decide what the rod means, what the rod is, but I'm just telling you it's in the Bible. And yet we live in a world that has decided God is wrong on that. Hey, let me tell you where we're going. We're living in a world where they're deciding that God doesn't know what men and women are. God made them! God doesn't know what tithing is. God doesn't know what I should give. Oh, he does. God doesn't know what holiness is. God's not upset if I, if I do a little social drinking, if I do this, if I, oh, oh he, he actually is quite upset about that. I'm just saying, and I'm, I'm, I'm picking things that I know you don't do. You're not drinkers and you're, you're not wrong on those things, but I want to tell you, we can get down to how we judge people and how we conduct our lives and, and we can be in church carrying the right Bible, saying amen in the right spot and still be distant from the Lord in our hearts. Right. Jeremiah said they came, he says, they, they came and they sat before me and they heard me preach, but as they heard me preach, they agreed, but their hearts were far from me. David said, you know what? I'm not willing to be that guy. I'm not willing to be the guy who says, this is what I'll do. This is how far I'll go. This is what I'll be. This is what I think. I want God to examine me so that what I think is what God thinks. Or let, me, let me do this this way. What God thinks is what I think. David says, Lord, would you search me? Because I am so good at justifying myself. And God, would you examine me? And Lord, where you find in my life, I'm differing from what you say is right. Lord, will you expose that to me? And then he comes along and he says this, will, 
Will you lead me? Will you lead me in the way everlasting? If the trying of David's thoughts exposes a difference to God, God's way, he wants to be brought into God's way. David wanted change in his life. He wanted change to godliness. He wanted the Word of God and the Spirit of God to govern his life. God's way is always the right way. Now, I, I know this is elementary. Stay with me a minute. The world has tr- changed tremendously. Would you agree? Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm 70, and I'm just telling you that in the last 15 years of my life, I have seen more change at faster speeds than the other years of my life. And it's getting faster and faster and faster and faster. (coughs) But can I remind you of something very important? God has not changed. God has not changed. And so what David is saying is, listen, the way of God has always been right. It is right today. It will be right tomorrow. It is everlastingly right. And God, what I want you to do is I want you to search me and I want you to look into the deepest chambers of my heart and where I've justified something that I love that you don't love, where I've justified an action or an attitude, where where I'm carrying something that I shouldn't carry. Lord, would, would you try me and expose that to me? Make it known to me because I don't want to differ from you. And Lord, where you expose things that are wrong, will you help me do the things that are right? Will will you help me change how I am at work? Will you help me change that anger and that temper where I might even lash out with corrupt communication? God, will will you help me bury that grudge and that bitterness that so colors how I see other people. It colors how I think about other people. It agitates every time I think of how that hurt happened. God, will you change how I speak to my spouse? Will you change how I think and feel about my spouse? God, will you change me and lead me in the way that is right? And oh God, if you will help me, I will go the way that you want me to go. Hey, it may mean that I have to humble myself. I, I tell this story, and I'm not trying to be funny, but I just to illustrate it. I, I am a choleric person. You say, what's a choleric person mean? Well, preacher, it means I'm right. I'm always right. Ask me, I'll tell you I'm right. That's who I am, because I'm right. I, I remember marrying my wife, who is a peace lover. And uh, I thought all of the, or the early part of our marriage, I thought, oh, that poor girl is struggling to be like me because I'm the right kind of person. And then one day, she helped me understand that she wasn't trying to be like me because <laughs> I'm not the right kind of person. And it was life-changing for me. I mean it. It was life-changing for me. It's the first time in my life that the Holy Spirit ever pulled the curtain back and said, dude, take a good look. And I had to humble myself. I had to say, honey, I I am so sorry for treating you like you were some person trying to grow up to be me. And and I could name a a dozen other things in my life where I just had to humble myself and said, you're not right. I think of the way I pastored for many years. It wasn't right. And I had to humble myself and, and, and I had to deal with those things in my life. Hey, listen, it, it may mean that you might have to say you're sorry to somebody. It may mean that you'll have to actually take a look at yourself and say, I can't continue to be like that. Not only humbling ourselves, I may have to correct some things. But I want to tell you, to become more Christ-like 
is worth whatever we have to do. Most of us would rather live unaware of our wicked ways. I'd rather not know where I'm different than God. Leave me alone. I feel like I'm a really good Christian. But you know what? Not a lot of people around me are getting saved. And can I tell you, I, I, I confess a lot of the same things over and over again. Maybe there's some parts in me that need fixed. Maybe there's some parts in me that need to just be brought to the Lord and say, Lord, will you help me? Will you search me and try me and lead me? One last quote and I'm done. Quote, There is a hypocrisy by which a man does not only deceive the world, but er very often imposes on himself that hypocrisy which conceals his own heart from him and makes him believe he is more virtuous than he really is and either not attend to his vices or mistake even his vices for virtues. Well, I'm just strong-willed. No, you're just sinfully bullying. You're just sinfully stubborn. Now back to the quote. It is this fatal hypocrisy and self-deceit which is taken notice of in those words, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. One of the, one of the best things that this could eventuate in our lives is this. Lord, I'm not a perverse person. I don't go to the wicked places of the world. I don't do the wicked things of the world. But I am a sinner. And I, and I know I'm not everything I should be for you. And, and, and rather than justify myself and, and make myself look better to myself, God, would you, would you do a season of searching me and making known to me where my affections are different than yours. My thoughts and my ways are different than yours. Lord, would you expose that to me? Because where, where I'm thinking differently than you, I've set an idol up. I don't want that. And I want to be led in the way that has been everlastingly right. And God, where you reveal to me my thoughts are different than your thoughts, I will change my thoughts with the help of your Holy Spirit. I challenge you this morning. <clears throat> Maybe God has already laid something on your heart this morning. But I would challenge you, if he has, deal with that thing this morning. If he hasn't, ask God this morning, God, would you begin a season of searching and trying and leading me?